Board of Trustees. And we'll begin by going around and introducing ourselves and sharing something that we are reading, if you wish. Michelle, we'll start with you. Oh, wow. Michelle Whitney Wash, and something that I am reading is Red Lip Theology. I cannot remember the name of the author, but it's written by a black woman who talks about the intersection of race and gender and faith. I just started it and it seems to be good. I'm also obsessed with audiobooks, so I haven't picked up physical books in a while, but I love a good audiobook. It's by Fuiko Zaki, a Japanese American writer. That's it, I just haven't started it yet. Hi, I'm David Ferguson. I think uh, I mentioned last time I was reading a trilogy. It starts with the Book of Coley. I finished it. It's pretty good. It's post-apocalyptic science fiction. So it's kind of fun. I think maybe it was teen fiction. I'm Chris Harrison, and I am reading um, a second book out of a series written by Jerron Hicks about some art mysteries um, that are written for young people. And the one I'm reading is called The Rembrandt Conspiracy. I'm Marilyn Wood, and I am reading The Canary in the Coal Mine. Um, this one's by Dr. William Cook. It's about the HIV outbreak opioid crisis in Scott County. I'm Jamie Burkhart, and I'm reading a lot of nonfiction right now written by IU students in the School of Education, and I'm grading their ed TPAs. <laughs> I am Kari Essary, and I'm reading the old classic, Rebecca. <laughs> well, hi, I'm Fred Reisinger, and I just finished, and I was trying to find the author's name. I wrote it down. I can't find where I wrote it. But uh, a uh, auto, uh, uh, not an autobiography, a biography of uh, former President Obama. Very interesting person. His early life was probably more interesting than his, his current life. Anyway, it's a great book. Well, thank you. We'll begin our evening with the consent agenda items um, that need to be approved. Um, so that would, be, that would include the minutes of the March 23rd, 2022 board meeting, the monthly financial report, the monthly bills for payment, the personnel reports, and the 2022 board meeting calendar. Do I have a motion to approve these items? Any questions or discussion? Um, I have a weird question. Um, why do we have so many banks? <laughs> I mean, you go through the pages and it's bank after bank after bank after bank. Um, well, we, we have an account at Old National Bank mainly because it's across the street. We have a safe deposit box there. Uh, most of our deposits, the federal or the uh, government funds go into our first financial account. And then we also have an account at German American Bank that's kind of isolated for incoming uh, credit card transactions. Okay. Yes. Okay. And they were pretty much here when I got here. Okay. So and maybe it keeps the things separate so that it's easier to see what's happening? Well, yes. The, yes, that's part of the advantage. Okay. The, the, the yes. box banks are the same, but the names have changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I was I just never asked that before. That's a good question. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda items signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Okay. Um, next will be the director's monthly report from Marilyn. So as always, I'm happy to answer any specific questions about the report, but I thought I would bring to your attention three different things. Um, one of them is Libby. So the changes that were made in Libby on March 1st um, have, have taken place, and although it was 
a little rocky with some of our patrons in terms of getting logged in and understanding what the changes were. I think it's really now at that place where it's just the benefit that we're seeing. So what the change was is that on March 1st, we joined a new consortium of libraries called the Indiana Digital Library. And this consortium is overseen by the Indiana State Library, and it uh, provides access to our OverDrive digital collection. Our former col consortium for that uh, had 17 libraries. This one has 199. Uh, so ultimately, what that means is that MCPL users have a much broader access point for materials, uh, a lot more titles and a lot more copies, and hopefully in that uh, far fewer or shorter wait lists for those most popular items. So that is in place now. Another one is concerning our seed library. So Maggie Hutt has been doing a lot of work with our seed library librarian, uh, Maggie, and she uh, has also been overseeing many of the related programs. So the seed swap event, which we had in partnership with Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, was very well attended. There was a lot of seed swapping, uh, and there were also a lot of leftovers, which uh, provided about 600 packets of of seeds for our seed library moving forward. And although this was a one-time partnership with Mother Hubbard's, we hope we might be able to do this again in the future because one of the goals that we had when we started the seed library was to have a seed swap. And so this has at least one time uh, provided that to us and we hope that given the success of this most recent one, we'll do it again. And then the final comment is about video game clubs. So. We have started a uh, uh, video game club um, for both adults and for teens. And the adult club met, they discussed the story, the design, artwork, music, and the game um, for the game Hades. And then a teen group met to discuss the same game and the same reasons or uh, background. And both events were very well attended. They generated a lot of discussion, a lot of engagement, a lot of play. And the programs and the related gaming programs engage gamers in not only library programming, uh, they bring folks in to learn uh, new things that we're doing, but also they reinforce that video games are really a critical part of our collection. And they're certainly a fast growing narrative art. Were there any questions about the director's report? Oh, absolutely. Um, and thank him publicly for his, his leadership and his service. And I also noticed that another woman, Jackie Lovings, Lovings. I think her, mm -hmm. for her service and yeah. things too. Two long-term employees. Um, and then also on May 6th, not only will I retire, but so, so will Bobby Overman. So we have several people going at about the same time. There are a lot of years of service there. Ruth Green will, uh, yep, Ruth Green maybe this week, so. I too would like to acknowledge the retirement of Michael White under his leadership, uh, very unique situation that we have in Monroe County with the amount of work that has gone into making CATS a very accessible um, uh, channel that people can watch all the uh, meetings that are going on. I think it's a very unique situation yes. and through his leadership that was very calming and going through all the changes in technology. I think he needs to be commended publicly. Thank you. I do have a question about the overdrive switch. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember, and I may have missed it, so I apologize. But were our patrons informed that it was going to be switched? Yes, we did that in advance because we wanted to both assure them that they weren't going to lose access or content, but also to let them know that they needed to sign in a new, on one new time. Okay. So we sent information in advance, put it on our website, uh, put it in our newsletter and otherwise. Perfect. Thank you. And as about the, um, the family memorial fundraiser that's uh, helping support the uh, Friends of the Southwest Branch um, Children's Department, mm -hmm. um, do, what's the connection the family has? And we're very grateful for their um, willingness to help us out. Um, is this a, a, just a longtime patron, or do we know anything about the family? Um, what I know is that it was a young family uh, that wanted to make a contribution to the library in an area that they had a, a real interest in and have young children. Okay. Fantastic. So very grateful for their community support. Any other questions or comments? Okay. 
then we will move on to the next item, which is old business. And we will begin with a Southwest Branch update and um, information about the opening day collection from Greer Carson. Good evening, everyone. So Southwest, the foundation walls are still going up. Remember, you can see this on our EarthCam. Uh, more or less live if you go to the Southwest Branch page on our website, but we're pretty close to seeing all the foundation walls up at this point. Uh, our stormwater detention system has arrived and is ready to install. I know that's very exciting. We're now working with our architects to review furniture and layout options for various spaces. Marilyn and I and a few department managers are, are taking great care to make sure we get the right kinds of furniture in the right spaces. And of course, what you pick in terms of the furniture often dictates how that space is gonna be used. And, and some of this is a guessing game, educated guessing game. Um, it's a lot of fun, but uh, we wanna get it right. So we're taking our time with that. Um, and we are working on the best way to install what will eventually be the automatic material handler or the sorter in the sort room at Southwest so that we have both a live check-in return slot, which is what everybody's used to in terms of you return your item, it automatically comes off your account, and also what we refer to as a dead drop option in case we lose power and you can't use those live slots, sort of a traditional drop your book in and then the next day that we check it in for you. So we want to have both just like we do at Ellettsville and like we do here. And so we're working with some vendors on ways to do that. And those are kind of the main things going on with Southwest right now. Can I answer any questions? I have a question for you. It's totally random. Are you all having conversations about how culture will be celebrated or observed in the new branch, like images, artifacts, um, different I don't know, items, not just in like collections during those heritage months, but actually in the fabric of the library? That's a great question. So we've been talking about some design and artwork options from the very beginning, and I think at this point that's one of those things where we just kind of keep open to see what new ideas come. Um, the real focus so far has just been architectural and topographical, so how do we create a branch that relates to the space, specifically the woods, and the sloped landscape and so on. So we haven't really gotten into anything cultural, but I think that would be a great conversation for us to have, uh, not only with, you know, internally, but with our friends over at the school and in that particular neighborhood. And I think yeah. there's a lot of opportunity there. We've already identified some of the spaces that could, that could be a really focal point for something like that, but we don't have anything on the wall. Do you want to talk about the opening day collection? Yeah. So last month, uh, we brought an RFP to you all and described what an opening day service is. And so just kind of summarize, um, our branch is going to have its own collection. To create that collection, we have to select all of the items and then process them, so stickers and labels and so on, catalog them, ship it out to the branch, and then shelf it. That's a lot of work, and it's not work that we're gonna have our current ACS staff do on top of what they already do. So we put RFPs out for bids for what's called an opening day collection service, where a vendor such as Baker and Taylor or Ingram or any of the folks that we usually work with will do all of that work for us and with us because we still make the selection decisions. Um, and then they keep everything and ship it to us when we're ready for it and in many cases help us get everything on the shelf all in advance of, of our, our grand opening. So we put the RFP out and we received a number of bids um, and they all look very good, they're very detailed, but they're also very complicated and they're going to require a lot more review on our part and in particular in working with our ACS staff so that we know what the selectors really want and need from a service like this. So all of this is to say we're going to bring the recommended bid to you all next month rather than tonight. This should not negatively impact our timeline. We've been assured by many vendors that we're still well within the window of getting this work done relative to our grand opening date or projected date. Uh, in the first part of next year. So there's no harm in waiting another month for us to be very careful about which bid we're gonna recommend. Any questions for Greer? All right, thank you very much for that update. Next we're gonna hear um, from Josh Wolf and he's gonna present um, some updates on the HealthNet Memorandum of Understanding as well as the guests from HealthNet Indianapolis. Thank you, Chris. 
Um, yeah, last, last month we had a little bit of a background um, about our, our developing partnership with the Health Net Homeless Initiative Program. Uh, you folks had five really good questions which we sent and they uh, did answer uh, in writing, but they also graciously agreed to join us for this meeting. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Varen Cantrell, the Chief Medical Information Officer, Abby Wants, the HIP Nurse <coughs> Practitioner, Melissa Burgess, the HIP Bloomington Coordinator, and Kay Wiles, the Director of the Program. So I don't, I, we can go through your original questions. I could ask them and you folks could answer um, if, if that would work or I could read what was written, uh, which is quite succinct and then we could go from there if you like. All right, all right. Uh, folks, do you still have those questions with you or would you like me to read them out and let you answer them yourself? If you could read them, that would probably be most helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first one that we asked was, uh, are you currently partnered with any IPL libraries and can we reach out to them to brainstorm ways to improve our partnership with you? Uh, I can take that one. Um, we have only partnered with the libraries in Marion County to offer vaccine clinics uh, for COVID vaccines and some of the flu vaccines. Um, but we have not partnered in the way that we are discussing partnering with you with having an actual clinic there. So does that mean that there is no partnership like the one that we're exploring currently, that we'd be the first? Right, with the, with the library, yep, you would be the first. Thank you. Uh, the next question down the road as we expand into a three branch system, and you've heard a little bit about that tonight, could we discuss setting up an additional Health Net Homeless Initiative Program satellite? Do you wanna take that one, Dr. Cantrell? Sure, good evening. Um, as stated, my name is Baron Cantrell and I'm Health Net's Chief Medical Information Officer. I also serve as the Medical Director for the Homeless Initiative Program. Um, you ask a, a great question and I think um, we need to do a needs assessment and to look at the demand. So what we traditionally have done is we will start um, smaller like we're doing now with one branch and we'll assess the need. And from there, um, as uh, demand dictates, if we can expand, we absolutely would love to do that. Um, is that something we can commit to right now? Um, yes and no. No in the sense that we don't know um, what our demand will be with the initial uh, what I would call pilot um, site. But yes, in a sense, as if there is a need, we will do the best that we can within our power and within the resources available to us to meet those needs. Thank you, Dr. Cantrell. Um, the next question, uh, how much of your on-site work is direct service delivery versus referrals to other agencies or to the clinic on Second Street? Do Understanding that this is a ballpark at this point. Well, I, so, I, so what I would say is, you know, as, as a medical in this particular setting, and I'll have Abby share here shortly, and then Melissa, if you could uh, jump on and share a little bit about what you do. But I think, you know, from the medical team's perspective, you know, the primary objective is um, meeting those initial medical needs at the point of care. At the same time, we do assess things like social determinants of health and other um, needs um, from our clients. And if we in essence, see a need, we do our best to try to meet that need. And th th sometimes it does require a referral to another specialist for me additional or specialty medical care. On the flip side of it, if there are social needs that require like case management, social workers, or community partners such as yourself, um, then we will absolutely make those referrals at the point of care as well. Since Abby is, you know, starting this program and is going to be in charge with expanding and growing, and I would like for her to share a little bit about what her experience has been like thus far and um, how she and Melissa work 
together to connect our clients um, at, from the point of care with the medical um, um, intake to wherever we need, wherever, whatever they need to uh, be taken care of. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Abby Wands. I'm a nurse practitioner with HealthNet. Um, so we're obviously pretty darn new just to Bloomington in general and just kind of starting to finally get our feet and get some some patients uh, getting our feet wet down there. Uh, we've primarily been out on the street seeing patients um, and, and Melissa has identified a lot of the areas of need um, where, where different homeless people, whether they hang out there during the day or um, maybe are seeking services. Um, and then our other outreach worker, Margaret, who's also on this call, they've kind of gone out and and have assessed like what patients are, they've gone out to the homeless camps. Um, Margaret has been spending time at the library as well um, and, and talking with the patients and establishing a relationship um, to which then, you know, they may say, she says, hey, we have a nurse practitioner down here every Wednesday. Do you have any medical needs, anything that you're concerned about? Uh, you know, if it's no, then it's no, we move on. She moves on, but she continues to follow up and check with them, checks with them. And then that also lets them know that if something does arise, they can approach her as well. If they do say that they have a, a need, then we generally we'll go out and try to find them in the community. Um, obviously, if we have a partnership with the library, um, we will have a set time at which we would get there and be there, whether it's every other Wednesday or, you know, we'd have set dates that could certainly be made public. Um, so that way we can make sure we're there when we say that we're going to be and, and address that need. You know, there's, there's a lot of chronic health needs in this population. And so while maybe they're concerned about like something acute going on, we're also going to look at the whole person and look at, you know, whether, you know, their chronic, their high blood pressure that may be causing some of their issues and maybe start them on blood pressure medication. Um, now, as for like referral and stuff, if they, we're kind of trying to work through that and where do they go for certain things and, um, we're, we're still getting all that figured out because again, we are primarily based out of Indianapolis. And so Bloomington is new to us. Um, but then we also may try to get them hooked up with a primary care provider, whether that's with HealthNet or IU Health or wherever it may be. So that way their chronic health needs can continue to be met um, it, even when they're no longer homeless, hopefully. One thing I'll add really quickly before Melissa and then maybe Margaret shares is to Abby's point is it is important that we allow the client to have a choice in where they would like to have their follow up care. So it's not we see you here at the library. Now you have to go to our clinic on Second Street. That is not how we operate. It is totally um, up to the client to choose where they'd like to go if they choose to pursue uh, primary care. With that being said, we just ask them, you know, where would you like to go or do you have a place in mind? And if they say no, then we can say this is a service that we offer. It is not required. There's no string attached. If we see you, then you have to come see us. That's not how it works at all. We are there to meet your need, be it under a bridge, under a tree, in the woods, wherever. We'll do what we can in order to meet those needs. But to Abby's point, it is important that yes, we do look at the whole patient because if we continue to just address acute needs and we put the chronic needs on the back burner, this will lead to adverse effects, um, hospitalizations, ER visits, uh, um, EMS transport visits, et cetera. And this ultimately would drive up the cost for everyone in Monroe County um, period and just healthcare costs in general. So. Um, and this is coming from an administrator. So um, I, I think um, we offer that choice is just one thing I wanted to share. And then for the referral piece, and Melissa, if you would just share a little bit about um, your role and, and what that looks like. Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Melissa Burgess. I am a social worker. I'm a 
I've been in Bloomington. I live in Indy, but have been going down there since November. Um, and Kay kind of charged me with really kind of creating this and seeing what this looks like and identifying kind of the needs and, and gaps um, for people experiencing homelessness in Indianapolis and what that kind of continuum of care looks like. So, um, you know, working uh, to really build that relationship with community partners to hear what are the needs in the community from the people that are already doing the great work in Bloomington. So how can we come in and kind of fill some of those gaps and just supplement what they're already doing? So we come at it from that holistic perspective. So obviously Abby is the nurse practitioner and she's focusing on the on all of the medical needs. And then what Abby or what Margaret and I look at is the housing, housing instability, um, mental health referrals, um, basic needs. So that, um, you know, in, in terms of outreach supplies, blankets, hats, socks, hygiene kits, um, just those basic survival items, um, just to make sure that folks, you know, have what they need to get through the night, you know, um, not necessarily long term, but we meet them where they are and what do they need uh, in, in, the, in the meantime right now. Um, employment income. So again, looking at all of those, like like Dr. V had said, the social determinants of health and being that linkage to getting, if we, if we can't provide the services, how do we provide that linkage and referral to make sure that their needs are met? So in looking at the library um, in Indianapolis, obviously, and we know, we know public libraries are a safe space for folks to go, very low barrier. Um, and so look, when I started looking at the library you know, in Indianapolis, we have a great relationship with them as well. We've never had a clinic, um, but I was thinking, where can we have a clinic for folks that don't go to shelter that, you know, maybe we can't even really catch on the streets because they're, they maybe are not an established camp or something like that. And we know that the library is again, a really safe space for folks to go. So crazy idea, but I was like, maybe we could have a clinic at the library because we know people come there they feel safe, they feel welcomed, um, and it's very low barrier to access, you know, any to access services. So um, that's really what what my goal was in looking at the library. Um, and so again, I know I'll let Margaret speak real quick. She's been going there um, for several weeks now and, and encountering several folks and providing that linkage. So Margaret, can you talk a little bit about how, your, where, your experience, what, what that's like? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Van Schaik, and I'm HIP Bloomington's outreach worker and case manager, I guess you could say. Um, so part of my work that I do in Bloomington is every, well, it can be more than Tuesdays, but right now, every Tuesday, late afternoon and early evening, I go do outreach at the library. So that basically just involves me wandering around and meeting people and just introducing myself to people who uh, I have been doing this work in this community for I guess like eight months now so I do know quite a the many faces in Bloomington so when I'm in the library I recognize a lot of folks <clears throat> and um, I just literally go up to them and introduce myself and explain what HIP and HealthNet is and then um, again like Dr. Cantrell said I um, always ask if they have a primary care provider where they would like to go and if they have no idea which recently has been the case, then I offer up health net services um, for as an option to them. So then I most of what I've been doing is um, making appointments with folks at the library. So I'll sit down with them, go to a room, hopefully um, a private room, and then make appointments with them. Um, and if I'm not doing something like that, then I am doing, like Melissa mentioned, like the holistic um, parts, including like housing assessments and things of that nature. Um, yeah, and once, I guess, from my perspective, once we get Abby um, in the library, then part of what I'll be doing in addition to all of that is um, like spreading the words about the clinic, it, spreading the word about the clinic itself, and then doing like kind of preparation type paperwork and stuff like that, as well as the follow up. So yeah. That was a long answer, but sorry, uh, we felt like we needed to share all of the different perspectives. So services in Bloomington and I do know that out of the city there is a liaison person that does work with um, I don't I think he I can't remember the position that he has have you gone, done any outreach to the people that are doing things already with the population as it's a re 
established in, in like the Wheeler Mission, the Shalom House, or even the city's established position. I think he's been in it like maybe nine months, six months, and I'm sorry I can't remember his name, but um, have you reached out to them and kind of pulled them in rather than, you know, kind of reinventing the wheel, see what they're doing and how they're doing it and what their connections are? Okay, we'll let you take that one. Oh, I'm going to pass it to Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm happy to take that. Yeah, actually, um, it's Charles. Charles, Charles I believe, yes, is, yes, yep. Charles. Yes. Yeah, uh, um, Margaret and I actually mm -hmm. met with him a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we, we've invited him to also participate in the uh, weekly outreach meetings. So we've established this relationship already now. And so starting to coordinate on how we can, because he focuses, I know, in a certain area of downtown. Mm -hmm. um, so he's, he's communicating with us on a, on a pretty regular basis. On folks that he's encountering and how can we connect with them if we're not already familiar with them and then also how do we connect them with um with care so yeah i appreciate you bringing that up because we we just met with him a couple weeks ago okay and regarding wheeler we are we uh, do have a connection with wheeler and abby just had her first clinic at wheeler was it last week i believe yeah last week we had our first mm -hmm. clinic there and we have uh, made contact with shalom and 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 um we're looking at um crawford and mm -hmm. a couple of other is it midway no middleway right. house no way middleway house so yeah so we were looking at other mm -hmm. um partners in the community but again we we uh, start start slow um do a needs assessment mm -hmm. and then scale as demand and resources allow us to great question and I'll add real fast too, just just in terms of Shalom, in terms of coordinating with outreach partnering. We Margaret does um, her outreach partner technically um, is one of the outreach workers from Shalom, so they go out on outreach together, so they can again coordinate care and make sure that you know to try to reduce the duplication um, of the efforts on the streets. I have a question. So with there being a provider shortage in general, I hear you all talking about the referral and the handoff. Will these people get expedited or privileged partnership with the provider, or will they also be expected to sometimes wait months to be able to see a provider? Is HealthNet addressing that? Can I, I'll say quickly, if I can, Dr. Cantrell, um, uh, that's a great question too, because there's um, so much need. So our goal is that uh, for, for folks who are homeless, they can see Abby and continue to see Abby as a nurse practitioner until they are linked with, I call it the medical home of their choice or, um, or their follow-up care. So if, um, you know, Margaret and Melissa will make sure that um, anybody that Abby sees um, has their medication or follow-up appointments and support them in making those appointments, keeping those appointments, and then also reporting back to Abby if um, something's going really well or something's not going so well. Um, and certainly then can coordinate with um, the HealthNet clinic there as well if there were, um, if there's a need that's outside of something that Abby can do due to um, time or scope. So hopefully we, um, we can bring folks in and continue to care for them um, until they are situated in a place to get ongoing care. And also um, as a, so I'm an internist and a pediatrician by training, so I'm board certified in both of those areas. And um, one thing that I guess we'll call it a blessing that Abby has is uh, I am her collaborating physician as the chief medical information officer, internist, pediatrician, our chief medical officer, who is over all of the um, clinicians at HealthNet, Dr. Reifenberg is an internist and a pediatrician. Our immediate past chief medical officer, Dr. Trainer, is an internist and a pediatrician. So she has direct access to us 24-7, 365. So should she run into any issues, like she could call me like right now and say, hey, I'm in front of this client right now. I need to run this by you and we can take care of it there. Regarding um, getting in with the specialist, um, you're absolutely right. There's a shortage and there's a backlog. I'll give you an example. One of my gazillion kids I have at home has special needs. And when we moved back home from, when we moved back to Indianapolis from um, Ohio, 
I'm a physician. I have great insurance. I have connections, contact. It took me a year to get into Riley Autism Center. A year, right? And so you think about, you know, um, what about this special population, these clients? We can't make them wait a year. So what we do, to Kay's point, we do our very best to manage what we can in the interim and while we're waiting to get them in for a specialist. So I'll give you an example. Let's just say that we have a patient with poorly controlled high blood pressure. <clears throat> we tried one medicine, we tried two medicines, we tried three medicines, we've gotten the lab work. We're doing everything that we can. We really wanna get them in with a kidney specialist or with the heart specialist to help us better manage this. So what we will do is we'll continue to work together. Maybe Abby has to see them every week or every two weeks until we can get them in four months from now. She can collaborate with myself. And if I don't have the answer, I reach out to Dr. Rick, who reaches out to Dr. Trainer, and we put all of our heads together and get this information to Abby. And if there's testing that we need, or if there's a client that we absolutely need to get in right now, ma'am, we can use our connections to the subspecialist and say, hey, I'm calling in a favor. I need to get this client in like next week. I'm worried about liver failure, or I'm worried about kidney failure, or heart failure, or I'm worried that they're having um, many strokes that are putting them at risk and are having seizures. I think there's something going on. We can't wait nine months to get them in to see you as a neurologist. Give me a medication regimen I can start right now. We'll get the medicine for them. We can manage them. And then I need you to open up your schedule and get them in. So can we do that for 100% of our clients? Probably not. But if there's something that's immediately pressing, um, then we absolutely will do whatever we can within reason and within uh, the laws um, to get these clients in for the care that we believe that they need. So that's a, an excellent question. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Any others? Um, actually, I think this was addressed. There was a question, uh, roughly speaking, are mental health services a large part of your mission? Or are you primarily focused on physical health and housing? And uh, I yeah, believe I think you Margaret asked. and, and yeah, Margaret and Melissa addressed that when they talked about the holistic aspect of it. And so, um, as you can imagine, and as data would show, a lot of our clients are patients who are experiencing homelessness right now. Mental illness, but more importantly, severe mental illness, is one of the things that's hindering them from being the best version of themselves so they can continue to make additional contributions to society. So some people say, well, they don't make a contribution to society. We could argue that all day long and we, that's a different discussion for a different day. But um, that is a big issue and it is a potential barrier to for these clients becoming whole. So what we've been working on, it's, it's, been a, it's been a bear, but we've continued to work on ways that we can remove the barriers from a um, point of care this is a client who needs mental health services um, or medication right now. They could have something like bipolar disorder and be in a, a manic phase. We need to get something to bring them down to help them think rationally so they can overcome X, Y, or Z. So one thing that, has, that, that COVID did for healthcare in general is it forced us to do a better job when it comes to the telehealth aspect of care, telehealth, virtual care, et cetera. So that is something that we have um, at our disposal. Also, if Abby were to see a client tomorrow who has mental illness, severe mental illness, she could call me and say, hey, V, I have this client and this is what's going on. You know, where do I start with medication? I may say, Abby, this is way above my pay grade, but I can pick up the phone and call Dr. Foster, who's our director of psychiatric services at HelpNet. I can call Dr. Levine, who's his partner. I can call some of our advanced practice nurses who are psychiatric MPs. I can call one of them because I have all of their cell phone numbers, tell them the story and say, this is what's going on, calling in a favor. This is what Abby needs. Where do we go from here? Abby can get that medication started, hopefully get some relief while we wait for five months to get them connected with uh, community mental health or in some instances, we're actually able to get clients in within a week to see some of our psychiatrists. It'll be virtual care. We can help them connect via a smartphone. And, and you know, some of our medical assistants have tablets. I'm thinking up in Indy right now, and they can use a, a, a iPad or a tablet to connect in with that psychiatric provider and get some services right there. Um, so um, it's not just primary care. And again, it's more acute care is what we're seeing. We're not seeing mostly primary care, it's more acute care. But in the grand scheme, 
see a need, meet a need. So what is that meet at the meet at the point of care? How can we address that? Can we do it right now? Does it require referral? Does it require follow up? So we're pretty malleable, flexible. And again, at the end of the day, our goal is to serve. And so be it partnering with the library or Shalom or Wheeler, whoever it is, it's not a competition. What we care about is can we make an impact in the lives of our patients? So HealthNet mission says to improve lives with compassionate health care and support services, not just not just health care, but compassionate health care and support service. And then the last part of our mission says, regardless of the ability to pay. And so as long as we continue to live out that mission and HIP ha the homeless initiative program has a, a lo an even longer mission. I don't know about heart, forgive me, Kay, but we try to live out that mission. And to be honest with you, these three ladies do a fantastic job and we are, we are more than blessed to have them as, as the face of the homeless program and the expansion of what's going on down in Monroe County. And then Kay Wiles is our director. Um, she just makes it happen. She makes sure we has, have the encouragement, the resources, et cetera. So I'll pause there before you kick me off for talking too much. <laughs> well, well, I have another question. It's a loaded question. I should also, can you all hear me? Okay, there we go. I should also preface and say, I'm asking a lot of questions, but I'm very impressed with this partnership idea and can think of at least four other organizations in this community that would b be good strategic partners to this. So I'm asking questions only to learn, not to interrogate. Um, but Abby, I'm gonna put you on the spot because people keep saying Abby is the provider, but there's a real need here. There is a significant volume of people who are experiencing homelessness. Does Abby have the capacity to really manage the, the potential load that could be here in Bloomington and Monroe County and what are we doing to diversify the providers? So if someone says, I don't feel comfortable talking with an Abby, I'd prefer to talk to someone who looks like me or someone who shares the same identities as me. Are we addressing that with like, is that a quick situation that we're gonna resolve or is this like a, we need to wait about a year? So I think Abby had to, well, she's back on now and I'm not sure she heard the question, but the question was Abby, when it comes to uh, volume of, of service. So um, how basically how many clients can you service? We know that we have a large need there. How many can we service? And I, what I would say is that there will be clients who will decline the services offered. So and we don't we can't answer that right now. You know, six months from now, I think we could give you a better idea as to what that demand is. And so I think that's kind of the rate limiting step when we talk about can we scale this out to two or three um, branches of the library? Well, we just don't know. Now, in terms of diversity, um, you know, our, our goal is to um, offer the client choice. So we can't force anyone to see Abby. And we do have our, our primary care clinic on, on Second Street, right, which is HealthNet Bloomington. And there are like five or six providers there. We have a diverse group there. Um, we have a, a, we have multiple providers who speak uh, Spanish and other languages. And so that is an opportunity as well, because ultimately our goal for our, our clients experience homelessness is to get them connected with a primary care provider. That is like the end game for um, what we're doing at, at the library in the campus is to get them connected. So we offer that to them. So if they say, hey, I wanna see someone who looks like me, Margaret, Melissa, how can we help find this client, someone who speaks um, um, uh, Hakachian, someone who speaks um, uh, Tigrinya, someone who speaks French, Swahili, whatever it is, um, how can we connect them? And that's where they go out and do the research and try to get them connected. So um, is it a quick process? Probably not, but as you build relationships, as we've mentioned here, and we learn more about the additional resources in Monroe County that we don't know about yet, that's where we build that repository of, of new partners and relationships. And Melissa and Margaret are, are doing that now and they're doing a fantastic job. So again, still a lot to learn here, but we're, we're in and we're really excited for this opportunity 
to make an impact. I have one final question, and maybe we talked about it last month, I can't remember, but where is the funding coming from? Did you hear that? I'll, I'll take that, yeah. Um, so HealthNet was, um, first of all, HealthNet has um, health care for the homeless funding, which is through HRSA. So it's federal funds in order to provide medical services and um, holistic health to those who are homeless. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that funding, but it's, um, uh, there are programs throughout the country for healthcare for the homeless to offer um, clinics. And there's all kinds of different ways of doing it. People have um, mobile units, um, people have clinics, um, people like we do, we go into all the shelters and go on the streets to offer services. So, um, so our initial funding in Indianapolis is from healthcare for the homeless. And then um, HealthNet received some of the American Rescue Plan Act funding. Um, and as part of HealthNet, the Homeless Initiative Program received a portion of that. And after conversations with um, the Bloomington HealthNet Clinic staff and uh, Forrest Gilmore, I, I think yes. you all are familiar with him. Um, I've had several conversations with those folks over the years about HIP. Um, they've wanted HIP to expand there and we haven't had the capacity. And I thought with these um, American Rescue Plan Act funds, this is the time um, to see what we can do to, to go to Bloomington and um, listen, figure out where, what we can offer. Um, so, so that funding will last through March 2023, and then we're collaborating um, with Wheeler and um, Shalom Beacon um, on the IU Health funds that came out and hope that we'll be able to um, use that ongoing funding to um, enhance these services and continue them further. Great, thank you very much. I um, I'm excited about this. I think this is a real need and, and thank you for being here to talk to us. Oh, you're welcome. I, I, I didn't share how excited we are as well. I mean, it's uh, libraries are such a unique place that offer respect and dignity to people. Um, I liken them to churches almost, you know, they're places where people feel safe, people can feel um, smart and individual and not uh, labeled. Um, so the fact that we have uh, library systems that are willing to um, accommodate these kind of services for people in our community is just awesome to us. So um, thank you so much for inviting us and, and entertaining this idea. Certainly, thank you for your expertise and for your time and passion. Um, next steps, we're, our legal teams are still working on the MOU, so it'll probably be May or June before we actually ask you to vote on something. But thank you so much, all of you. All right, thank you for having us. All right, thank you. Have a great night. Thank you, Doug, and the presenters for sharing with us this exciting opportunity for the library and for the community. Um, our next item is new business, and for the first item we have um, an approval for Director Greer Carson to begin making bank signatures. So I'm gonna ask for a motion to approve this. This is a, this is a motion uh, for the board Gary, to I'm authorize. Oh, Gary, hang on, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I need a motion to approve. Uh, motion so moved. And a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, now Gary can go ahead and okay. explain what we're approving. Yes, uh, this is a motion for the board to authorize Greer Carson in his new role as MCPL director to be a signer on MCPL bank accounts at First Financial, Old National, and German American banks. The current signers include Director Marilyn Wood until May 7th, uh, Treasurer David Ferguson and Financial Officer Gary Lettler. So the new signers will be Director Greer Carson, Treasurer David Ferguson, and Financial Officer Gary Lettler. Can I answer any questions? Does Greer want to sign? 
<laughs> we need him to sign. <laughs> part about this is that the bank requires this be a part of our minutes before they will allow it to happen so we're, we will write this into the minutes after approval and then we can get him assigned all those in favor of approving this uh, approving Greer to make bank signatures uh, signify by saying aye. aye aye opposed nay the ayes have it um, the next item under new business is a preview of a compensation study plan and benefits discussion, and we have Marilyn Wood and, uh, director, uh, and director and Becky Throckmorton, the Human Resources Assistant Manager, to explain this to us. So I'm going to give a bit of an overview on this, and then we're going to invite Becky to join us to answer all of your questions about benefits. Um, but you, know, you may, many of you will remember that last October, during our discussion about health insurance benefits for 2022, uh, we talked uh, about having a broader conversation about benefits insurance in particular before there was a decision that was required. And so this is the beginning of that conversation. Um, in, in May, we will bring JA Benefits uh, to make a presentation about what kind of health benefits or options might be available. So that'll be the next part of this conversation. But uh, we also are planning for a broader wage and salary study during 2023 so that we have a better picture of what that comprehensive plan and benefit and wage package for our, for our staff is. And so um, as noted in the benefits review that's part of your packet, there are several really critical conversations that our staff make before they either choose to take a position with us or to stay here when they, are, uh, when they face other opportunities in the market. So our goal is really to ensure that we're competitive in our market right now. And we know that the total their total benefit package is more than just wages and health insurance. And we gathered this data that we're going to share with you today uh, to ensure that we're all on the same page, that we all understand what we offer to staff, uh, how our staff value, the, value those options or the benefits and the overall cost to the library to provide them. So ultimately, we really do hope that this information will help us to develop a strategy for compensation and overall wage structures. And later this summer, Kyle, uh, Becky, and Greer will be bringing the board an RFP for a wage and salary study, um, which will provide some of that additional information to inform our decision making. But today we're going to be focusing on the benefits, which <clears throat> includes a full list of the benefits and CPL offers, and the responsible payer and the employee eligibility. Uh, we have a look of the the a 10-year view of the number of staff who have enrolled in each of these optional benefits. We have uh, a look at the cost very specifically to each individual item that's of benefits. And we have an overall benefit cost as a portion of our total wage and salaries. And then specifically, we provided some of the 2022 cost share. So you can see just how uh, people pay for each portion of it in this year that we're in now. And then in advance, in advance of our meeting in May with JA Benefits, um, Becky prepared a summary of the benchmark data that JA provided and may talk to you a little bit more about. But today, I invite Becky to come to the podium and talk to you about benefits. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, I'm excited to be here on the MCPL staff. I'm excited to be um, the assistant manager for HR. I come from a background of benefits, and so I have a lot of the benefit lingo, and I apologize, I try and keep a lot of it to be layman's terms, but if I answer a question and answer it with a term that you don't know or something, please ask more questions and let me know how I can clarify. So I'll start out, do you guys have any questions initially off the packet, or do you want me to run through it in more detail? I have a quick question yeah. for you. The review of this, is it going to include like an equity audit to make sure there's not disparities based on gender, race, ethnicity? Um, so a, a portion of what we looked at as far as like the numbers of employees who are enrolled um, looks at the employees that have those benefits eligible to them. So those are based on our um, employees based on hours, based on their status. And we do have all of that data, um, gender, race, the, you know, all the different demographics that we would look at. So Perfect. we can 
You can present that if you need it. Other questions? Do you want me to go through anything specifically in, in more detail, or do you want me to just kind of run through the packet? Okay. Um, and I apologize, I stapled mine together. So. Um, so the first page, page 86 in the packet that you guys have, runs through each of the benefits and what's offered by the employer, what's split with the employer and the employee, um, and then what is only the employee responsibility um, if somebody wants to enroll in that benefit. And so it runs through, we do have mandated benefits. So we have PERF, which is our retirement fund. Um, the employer paid taxes. Um, those are required that we pay. Unemployment and COBRA. Those are all benefits that they say we, we have to offer. And so we don't have an option. Those are all employer paid. They're for all staff. Um, the next piece here is the benefits that are provided at no cost to the employee. So these are benefits that the MCPL has decided to offer to employees at, at no cost. Um, so this includes the 3% PERF um, that's for all full-time employees. Our long-term disability um, is provided by the library to all full-time employees. We do offer an employee assistance program that um, is available to all employees regardless of their hour status um, that has been recently expanded. Um, so that is a 24-7 benefit that's available to the, all staff. Um, we do have continuing education, development, and travel. Um, and then we have life and accidental death and dismemberment. That's two times the salary for all full-time staff. Holidays, personal time, and sick leave. Um, those are all benefits that are provided at no cost to employees. And then we have optional insurance. So health insurance, the clinic that we offer, um, which is the Everside Activate Clinic, health savings account and dental insurance. Those are all benefits that are split with the employee and the employer. Um, Short-term disability is also split. Parking, um, we've made an effort to make parking affordable and um, have a variety of options that are available for staff as well as bus passes. Um, and then we have a number of benefits that are available for employees that they're, they're choosing. Um, that is covered 100% by the employee. So those are benefits like vision, uh, additional life insurance, critical illness, cancer, and accident insurance, legal shield, which is prepaid legal, um, flexible spending accounts, identity theft, and our 403B annuity. Those are all eligible for employees, and you can see the number of hours that staff works in order to become eligible for those. Any questions on that page? Are employees generally happy with their benefits package? Like, is that what you all are hearing, or do you ever hear concerns? So, um, I know I'm relatively new in my position, but I've, I, don't have, I don't hear any concerns from employees. There are definitely questions when open enrollment comes around on, you know, how the benefits work and what to enroll in, um, but I haven't heard any major concerns. Um, part of what we recommend for the sort of the RFP and our next steps would be to do a full employee um, survey to see if there's things that we're missing, see what people value, see what they're using, and really get more insights into the employee experience. It's a great question. Another question for you. Yeah. Did any of these benefits change post-COVID? Um, so the one that I know we expanded is our EAP. Um, so that's the Employee Assistance Program. That one was really um, expanded to meet the employees' needs. They were asking for more, um, you know, offering and, and more availability for, it includes things like mental health, um, financial assistance, child care, elder care. Um, it's a very well-rounded program that's available to employees at any point in time. history of the library has basically been that the, the benefits have been good. 
that's kind of been the overall trend in the years that I've been on the board. Have been good. Okay. Yes. Our our good benefits. Mm -hmm. Yes. Am I correct? I, I think that's correct. Yeah, that's yeah. that was the feeling I we, and one of the things that I think we're really trying to get to the bottom of is is are we offering the right ones or is there something else that would be of greater benefit to the employee? I mean I hate to overuse that word, but um, uh, we don't know, we don't hear that, uh, but finding out what the market is offering and what others might like to see is what we'd like to get to the bottom of. Um, and then as you move through the packet, there's a spreadsheet that shows the number of employees that are enrolled, and this runs back 10 years. Um, so we wanted to see how many employees are enrolled in each of these benefits and how many are eligible. And so you can kind of scan through that and see we've been pretty consistent. There have been some trends where, you know, more or less employees have enrolled in a specific benefit. Um, and some of those things we can explain based on some changes that were made. Um, some changes were made with, you know, legal policies where we could or couldn't offer something to as many employees. Um, and some things are just changes to the plan themselves or how we marketed something. If there's no questions on that page, which is 87, I'll go ahead and move on to the next one. I have a question for you. Yeah. So how do you all decide what full-time people get versus the 20 plus hours? So I see that 20 plus hours get dental and vision, but not health, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. how do you all make that decision? That's actually set by the government. So okay. we're not allowed, we're not able to offer health insurance to anyone who okay. works under 30 hours. Okay. Per week, because they're not considered full time. Oh. They changed because before we always offered mm -hmm. health care to part time employees. That's what I thought. Always okay. did, yeah. Okay. But, and we couldn't. Gotcha. Okay. That's so. what I thought. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The ACA changed that. Mm -hmm. I'm no, um, no data for um, parking um, before twenty before twenty twenty one. That that was a new benefit that was added that year. It wasn't a new benefit. It just the way that we have the reporting, we weren't able to pull numbers on that because of the way the system changed over. Okay. Um, and there have been changes in what's available for parking. A lot of that is dictated by the city and um, what they're willing to make it available to us. And that is a benefit available to all staff? Uh, yes, yeah, so their parking options are available for all staff. Um, we do start with zone four parking, which is the residential area. That's available for everyone. And then once someone moves up um, to be a full-time staff, there are additional options that are available. The lots have limited availability. Um, we have you know, a certain number of passes for the garages and different options like that. I'm sorry. Yes. I imagine. There is a limited number of spots available for parking in any of those places. And then we do also offer bus passes. So those are paid 100% by the library. And those are available for all employees as well. Um, and then we have the bike parking as, as well. That's a new space that's indoor where folks can park their bikes and have them be secure while they're at work. And also, obviously, parking is a topic for the downtown branch, but the Ellettsville branch, you know, we don't have the same conversation for, for that branch. And the Southwest branch will probably be a different conversation as well. So, other questions on? Okay. Um, the next page on here, page 88 and 89. Um, go into, they split out the employer and employee cost. We looked back five years for each of these benefits. So you can see, obviously, health insurance is one of the bigger costs um, for benefits. But you can see what each of those benefits um, costs on an annual um, amount. And then you can see what the library is paying and what the employees are contributing for each of those benefits. And I know you tried to avoid this. I'm sorry, I'm being No, difficult. you're fine. Back to page 87. Yeah. I don't see parental leave 
Yes. Do we have that? So we don't have paid parental leave. Okay. Um, we do have for, um, you know, mothers who go out because they have a baby, we do offer short-term disability. And so okay. short-term disability paired with our paid leave um, covers that maternity leave. But that's only for mothers? But yes, yeah. We do also offer FMLA, um, which is the Family Medical Leave Act, and so that would cover like a new father um, or a parent who didn't give birth would be able to use that FMLA. Okay. That also co covers adoptions. Um, foster parents, those, you know, those other types of situations. Are there questions on any of the spreadsheet where we've got all the numbers, pages 88, 89? I know that's a lot of data to look at. <laughs> Um, and then, like Marilyn mentioned, we did include the premiums. So these are what the employees are currently paying. Um, so page 90 is our dental premiums, and you can see those are split, um, and it splits it out by the number of hours that somebody works. So you can see what those different premium for the employee and the employer contribution. The parking, you'll see on there, we've got zone four and bus passes are listed. Um, page 92 is our health insurance, and that includes the clinic as well. Um, page 93 is our vision insurance, which is an optional, the employee pays that full premium. Um, that's not a split cost. Any questions on any of those? Um, and then to move on, page 94 and 95, I summarized there was a probably about a 100-page benchmark that JA Benefits provided for us. Um, and so I've summarized that into two pages here that just kind of give us an overview of how the library benefits, um, specifically health insurance, compare with national average, local average, and JA Benefits book of business. Um, so that gives us really good um, Bloomington-specific and so if you look at that full benchmark data, there are multiple benchmarks in there and you can look and see what's national versus Bloomington. Um, and I guess to reiterate some points that we've already made, our benefits are very good. Um, they've been very intentionally put together um, and we are in a really good place. So I've done these before where there are some massive changes that are being recommended and I'm happy to report there's nothing here where we're way off the line way out of the benchmark. Um, and so the three plans that we offer, um, one of them is a PPO plan, um, which has a $500 deductible. Those are going away. Um, they're very difficult to get, they're very difficult to offer, and the fact that we're able to offer that $500 deductible PPO plan is really great. Um, some of the benchmark data that I've got here um, outlines that our premiums for that PPO plan are right in line with everyone else's PPO plan. Um, and one of the things to note there is that we have a $500 deductible, well the benchmark was $1,500 deductible on that PPO. So our premium is in line with the premiums other companies are paying, um, but we have a better benefit there. And then the split that we're doing with employee and employer cost, um, overall for all three of our plans, we cover 100% of the employee only, um, which is above and beyond the benchmark um, on all three plans. And then the employee plus, so spouse, child or children and family, we're right in line um, with on all three of our plans. And so that's a really good thing. Um, and then the only place that we didn't meet the benchmark, so we're above on the employee only. Um, the place where we weren't meeting the benchmark was on the HSA contribution for employee or employee plus. Um, and so there's some information in the um, summary that I gave on that. Um, it, you know, it's a decision based on how we want to offer the benefit and what we want that to look like, um, but those were the two biggest variances where we were above and beyond, or above and below. 
and then I also outlined some things to consider as we're looking at 2023. Um, open enrollment renewal, um, if we're wanting to look at other carriers, I kind of included some things to look at, some things to consider to make sure that we're really taking care of employees and considering what a change in provider would look like for them and, and making sure that we're creating something that is fair and equitable and that we've considered the employees. Any questions on any of this? Thank you. So one of the things that I'll add as a question for you all is um, we're going to bring JA benefits to talk to you next month. Are there any questions that you want them to be prepared to answer or you want to think about that and send them to us and we can forward them to them uh, just so that they know. I mean, obviously, they're going to provide an overview of what the options are, but if there's anything specific that you'd like to know, we'll be happy to prime that. Front does not seem to be to work. Anything else for either one of them? Okay. Well, Becky, thank you very much for your thorough presentation and thank you. for going through all this data for us. Well, thanks for all the great questions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have our department presentation, which is on public services from Josh Wolf, our assistant director of public services. Hi, folks. It's me again. Um, so some months ago, Greer discussed some of our continuous improvement changes. Uh, so I just really wanted to take this opportunity to give you guys an update uh, on how those have been playing out, uh, specifically for public services departments. Um, as he mentioned at the time, despite some benefits, our previous structure with staff floating around to multiple a audiences uh, on a daily basis wasn't serving us well. Uh, so we took on the work of improvement ourselves, and we did it collectively, uh, which really gave everyone the opportunity to participate in and to own the changes that we were making. Um, and we began seeing the fruits of that labor right away. For public services, getting this right has been a flagship focus uh, for, for quite a while now, and it's very important to me personally. Um, and we had teams, two teams really, of cross-functional teams working on this. And the, if I had to sum it up in one sentence, it would be that we returned to a conventional department structure, um, which was great. But in order to do that, uh, beginning uh, late last fall, Marilyn, or early last fall actually, Marilyn Greer and I met with every member of public services individually to discuss their passion and skill set before deciding which department they would land in. I can tell you that announcing those decisions was a little like announcing who gets which roles in a dramatic production. Uh, it, was a, it was an exciting time for us. We have a new cadre of managers, most of them former strategists, who we immediately trained on the basics of scheduling and time card management, handling sick lines, all the housekeeping, setting up office spaces and a host of small details like that. We actually had a moving day, um, which was pretty wild. With the help of IT, we redesigned our phone and chat reference services to roll through a series of different departments rather than being centralized. And on November 1st, we flipped the switch. Um, what have we seen since then? A lot of what the continuous improvement teams were asking for. We're seeing better collaborative work, a higher output of programming ser and services simply by virtue of the fact the departmental staff are working alongside one another for 80 to 100% of their time. Schedules have become more standardized, which helps staff, but also provides consistency for the patrons who visit us regularly. We, al we already have a greater clarity of the lines of supervision. Everyone working in public services now has one manager and works in a department of five to 16 or 17 people. And it's difficult to overstate the importance of this in regards to communicating processes and managing large projects. This was one of the highest priorities of the team recommendations. We're better at managing change uh, and implement Im implementing new uh, system-wide uh, initiatives. The teams also recommended that in order to avoid silos and to promote cross-departmental communication, staff should work one day per week in another department. So most of our full-time staff spend 20% one day 
with another audience. This has actually been really great. It made me nervous, uh, but I was, uh, I was wrong about that. Uh, it promotes transitional programs and services between children's and teen audiences, between teen and adult audiences, um, as well as among our different buildings, among our outreach staff and buildings. So we've held on to some of the synergy of the previous structure. I've personally worked alongside children's librarians who have become accomplished teen librarians in just four months, uh, which affects everything from programming to reference services. We're forming new training cohorts for public services managers so that in June we can launch a performance management program that was also designed and proposed by another one of our continuous improvement teams, and that'll be for all staff. Uh, the team also recommended a patriot account and ILS coordinator to act as a central authority for all processes involving library card accounts and circulation uh, to help expedite any patron concerns that we have. Christine Sneed is doing that, and she is most of the way through building a knowledge base uh, in our new internet platform that can, so that staff can get quicker answers to account questions for our patrons. Uh, if you look at the upcoming summer program guide, which I think is going to be upon us in a matter of days uh, or perhaps a week or so, I think what you'll see is a return to pre-pandemic capacity for programming. We're very excited. Uh, the summer reading program this year, we're, we're expecting uh, for all audiences to be really special again. Um, all of this once more came from the tireless work of our cross-functional teams and from system-wide input during every step of the process. And we're not done. Uh, implementation is ongoing. In a May, we have to begin to assess the efficacy of some of these new processes, starting with the easier mechanical ones, phones, chat. Did what we do work? It doesn't end. Uh, it's continuous improvement. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Also, probably noticed that as well. I mean, I know that that has been a concern in the past that, you know, they want to know that children's librarian and they want to see that person there. Yeah. Yes, we got a mm -hmm. lot of input on that in the process mm -hmm. and we've heard it from our patrons too. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you, Kathy. And I know that you want to make sure that you're happy. <laughs> I've yeah. heard that many times. <laughs> they like us better when we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, they care about you. Yeah. The idea that you spend 20% of your time in another department and seeing the work that others are doing. Um, I love that because you get to kind of see the flexibility or the chaos that may happen. It gives you a reverence, I think, for the work that your colleagues may have to do. It gets you out of that bubble. So I think I'm going to take that back to my workplace. I like that idea a lot. Thank you, Michelle. Any, any other questions? Thank you. Your work on the continuous improvement pro process. Um, do we have anyone, next item is public comment. Do we have anyone in the audience that would like to address the board? Okay, seeing none, before we get to adjournment, I would just like to congratulate Marilyn. You have survived your last library board meeting. <laughs> so your last time in the hot seat. <laughs> But thank you so much for all the time and energy and dedication you have given to the Monroe County Public Library over the past 10 years. We are going to miss you terribly, but we wish you the best of luck in enjoyment in the future. It has been my pleasure and privilege. I thank you all. Thank you. Are you kidding? Of course you will. Okay, <laughs> and Greer, you're up next, Mom. You start your tenure in the hot seat. Yay! So <laughs> we welcome Greer Carson aboard as our new director starting next month. Okay, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor of adjourning, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>